the panelists for this speaker, uh, this panel rather, are individuals who have authoritative experience in their own right, in their specialties. And uh, I, as moderator, have given them the liberty to use their time as they wish. They may reflect upon what you heard during the course of the day today, or they may want to share their wisdom and vision in their specialty into the future, or they may expand upon one or other topic that was discussed during the course of the day. And uh, I, will, I will first call upon Professor Tim Brumendorf, who I believe you want to address on targeted therapies. But this is your time. Eight minutes to the clock, say whatever you want to say. Yeah, thanks very much. I think I have to speed up. Um, I would like, anyway, I would like to thank uh, Professor Knecht very much for the option, opportunity to talk here to you. I was asked to talk about underlying principles and future targets in head and neck cancer. Can I forward the slides myself? Or? And for this purpose, I think it's important to just give you a very brief, although all of you are familiar with targeted therapies, just like to give you a very brief introduction into the topic. I think we all know that more than 30,000 genes are encoded in the human genome. About 6,000 of those genes are actually involved in signal transduction. 20% of all genes are involved in signal transduction. Among those, about 500 are protein kinases, and roughly 130 of those 500 are actually tyrosine kinases. As you all know, kinases uh, uh, catalyze the transfer of phosphate from ATP to amino acid residues in, in polypeptides. We can discriminate between, between the, the, within the protein kinases, uh, between the tyrosine kinases and the, and the serine threonine kinases. The most important ones for head and neck cancer, at least to my opinion, of the serine threonine kinases are the aurora kinases, mTOR, and the pololite kinases. Within the tyrosine kinases, I think the most important receptor tyrosine kinase uh, is actually EGF, at least for head and neck, but also PDGF receptor and VEGF receptor is very important. Among the non-receptor kinases, the most sort of prominent ones are ABLE and SARC, and for head and neck cancer, of course, of course, SARC is, uh, is very important. Now, uh, if one discriminates between receptor and non-receptor tyrosine kinases, I think the important one, this is just, of course, a selection, um, and the important ones shown here are circled in red, which is uh, for head and neck cancers, EGF, PDGF receptor, and VGF receptor. All of these receptors share some homology in terms of, of, of structure, but I don't want to go into the details. Um, just like to briefly show you how these, these receptors actually work upon ligand binding. These typically uh, monomeric receptors uh, start to dimerize, and by this dimerization, they get autophosphorylated, and this autophosphorylation then leads to the recruitment, for example, to the recruitment of adapter proteins that then um, exchange, in this case, a GDP to GTP, and by this, uh, by this mechanism, activate RAS, which is then uh, going to the nucleus and or, or mediates signaling via other uh, signal transduction molecules. Um, no matter whether this is, is mediated via RAS or other pathways, the, the uh, is a way or the, 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 the kinase actually mediates a signal into the nucleus and the sig signal then uh, propagates either angiogenesis or invasiveness or survival or proliferation of the affected cells and of the stimulated cells. Now, if we look at the non-receptor tyrosine kinases, and those are so far not in the focus of head and neck uh, tumor biology, to my opinion, um, the mechanism is slightly different. These, these uh, recept non-receptor tyrosine kinases are typically kept in an inactive state, either because of inhibitory proteins or because of intramolecular autoinhibition, and I think the most uh, famous part, uh, candidate for this mechanism is JAK2. Um, An activation in this non-receptor tyrosine kinases typically occurs via dissociation of these inhibitors or uh, via the recruitment of transmembrane receptors or transphosphorylation. And I think the most important candidate of the three that are listed here is SARC. However, the, the, sort of the paradigm for these kind of receptors being useful targets for, for malignoma treatment, I think is in fact uh, ABLE and BCR ABLE. And the important thing to note here, I, don't, I know this is not a hematology talk, it's, a, it's of course not, not on CML primarily, but nevertheless, I think this is really a model disorder because the target here, BCR ABLE, is really 
required and also sufficient for, for the disease. And this is something that's really special in oncology. I think in head and neck cancer, we still have the problem that we don't have very exclusive targets. All of the targets that are addressed so far are to some degree redundant and not exclusive, and that's important. But th that we need to identify these targets is, imp is, is even more important, also in solid tumors, and that we can be extremely successful if we, if we successfully uh, achieve this goal uh, is shown here in the case of CML, as you can see, on the, on the right-hand side here, this is how, how Imagine it works in CML, and this is what the responses that we can achieve. This was the gold standard at the time uh, of, of first uh, publication uh, of Imatinib interferon alpha, complete cytogenetic remission rate on interferon alpha, and this is what we could achieve by using a single orally available uh, molecular targeted agents, so this is really a, a major breakthrough that also translates into dramatically improved survival rates. So this is, this is definitely something special, but this should be our goal for other solid tumors as well. There is important targets that can be identified in, in, in head and neck cancer as well. It can be uh, related to angiogenesis, can also be related to SARC, to the SARC family kinases, can be related to the mTOR pathway, which is really important because it's one downstream uh, signal pathway, and, and also to the aurora kinases that are typically upregulated in head and neck cancer. Most of these uh, pathways, including here the histone deacetylases, uh, are in the process of being in investigated in head and neck, most cases only phase one and two trials, but nevertheless some promising results have come out of these studies. Um, and I think it's really important to continue us on this way. And I gave a very personal uh, sort of preference on one of the studies that have been published, which is a combination uh, of, of Bevazizumab and Pemetrexid here that showed, uh, to my opinion, extremely uh, impressive response rates, although only in, in a very low number of patients. Nevertheless, I think that's the way to go, which is why I would like to conclude that there is a number of promising new treat, uh, targeted treatments that are currently being evaluated in head and neck cancer. However, the problem is that the specific role of most of these targets in, in head and neck cancer is insufficiently defined. It's not really clear in almost all of these cases, except of EGF maybe, uh, that, that it's not clear whether it's the deregulation is actually causative or whether it's epiphenomenal. Intensified research efforts on the identification of novel, ideally non-redundant targets and or synergistic targeted approach is clearly warranted, and novel biomarkers that help us to, to predict response in these tumors is, is really urgently needed. Therefore, uh, or maybe on top of that, ideally promising compounds should really be evaluated early in systemic treatment and not as typically done in, in the very last line of treatment. With that, I think I'd like to conclude. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I think uh, because of uh, lack of time, will permit one question from the audience to each of the speakers. Any question for Dr. Brumendorf or comment? Excellent, thank you. No, you can't be. <laughs> or, or should I wait go ahead. for my... Sure, go ahead. I have one, one comment, and, and um, I think we are unique in the disease that we treat because um, it's uh, as opposed to say lung cancer or breast cancer, head and neck cancer I view as a local disease or a local regional disease. And with these targeted therapies, uh, if we are really going to make an impact on the natural history, we need to study them in, in that setting. So study them uh, post-operatively or in the context of chemotherapy radiation or, or with radiation alone. That of course is, is the power of the cetuximab study, the, the Bonner study, in that uh, it made a difference in the cure rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think um, we have to uh, remember that when we're integrating targeted agents, uh, and, and especially when we're approaching either the federal granting agencies or the pharmaceutical companies uh, to allow us to use these agents. Great, great comment. Okay, the next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Wilfried Budak, and he's going to take us into the future. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank you all that you are still here. I didn't expect so many to be here at this time, but uh, I want to give you a little view of the future, a personal view, of course, what I think will be the, the important developments in radiation oncology, let's say, within the next 10 years. And of course, um, we will have a, a tremendous improvement of radiation techniques. We all 
already have um, gone, started IMRT in many centers, but I don't think it's standard of care right now. But we will have a lot of improvement in this area. And uh, the next step is to come to protons and carbon ions. Some centers have started now. The image-guided radiotherapy that might not be so important for head and neck cancer and what I call biological treatment planning. Um, with IMRT, here an uh, extreme case we treated at our department a few years ago, uh, where you see what you can do, what is the power of IMRT. You really can have any dose distribution you want. It's just a matter of how many um, um, small fields you use to add up to end uh, with a um, plan like this. This was a nasopharyngeal carcinoma with extension uh, to the meninges. And we really got a complete remission. Finally, of course, this patient died from distant disease, what is not unexpected. So we will not really um, have uh, the problem solved with IMRT, but we will have some improvement. And if you go to carbon ions and to protons, uh, he, on the left side you see the famous Bragg peak and uh, it really looks always very good if you just compare to a single field technique here for uh, photons and this for protons. It looks like a really very big difference. But if you look to the right, this is real life. The target on the right side, you see there is no difference inside the target between IMT treatment and protons. The difference is outside the target, the low dose range. Uh, here in a four field technique, very simple technique, you have 20% approximately in proton beam and up to 50, 60% with photons. And nobody really knows what this difference of 40% really means for the patients. It may be for older patients, it's meaningless. We don't know yet, but we have to prove that. But um, nevertheless, I think protons will be successful, especially in head and neck cancer and some indications, uh, severely grand tumors and other tumors probably um, will have a benefit. Um, but we have to check that. And uh, at the moment, the problem is uh, the, are the costs. Protons are very expensive, but maybe in 10 years we will have proton beams from laser and they may be as uh, much, maybe much cheaper and, uh, than the proton uh, beams we have right now. So if you have the choice, maybe in 10 or 15 years, you can buy for the same price photons or protons. I think most people, oh, well, I would prefer to go for protons, but I don't know what is going to happen here. Here again, the difference on the right side, protons, and the left side, the same plan for the same patient with photons. And you see the difference is really only in, low, in the low dose area here, but not in the high dose area. Biological treatment planning, what do we mean by that? Uh, this is based on PET information. That means on uh, information about the uh, pathways that are activated. Uh, it depends a little bit. You, we use glucose right now, but we could use very different markers as well. And usually we uh, define now the CTV and our PTV uh, as radiation oncologists like uh, shown here. But now we, um, in the future, maybe we use hypoxic markers like f miso or f atsa um, or markers for proliferation or for, for the tumor burden, uh, other markers here. Um, and then we get all together and come to a biological target volume uh, that might be completely different, at least in part, uh, for, from uh, the classical target volumes. Uh, because we have information about the uh, activity um, of different pathways. And this ends with a biological target volume. And with IMRT, of course, we can go to doses like uh, 77 or 40 uh, or 84 gray or even higher. And if you use uh, carbon ions, you could even go to 100 gray or something like that in, in small areas of the tumor. And then everything what lives on DNA basis will be dead. Uh, okay, so, but the other important thing, it's not technique, it's um, the combination with chemotherapy that has to develop and targeted therapies like antibodies, small molecules, uh, maybe SERNA, et cetera. 
but I think we, we came to this 